This video is for section 6.3, the binomial distribution. And this is a type of problem you actually saw in ProbStat. And we're gonna look at similar problems as you did in freshman year, but now we're gonna look at them through a more sophisticated eye. Um, so take a minute to read the example here. We have a manufacturing plant. Um, there are some defective parts. The probability of having a randomly uh, selected defective part is 15%. We're gonna take a random sample of eight parts. We want the probability that exactly two are defective. And then later, we're going to look at the probability that two or less are defective. If this kind of problem seems familiar to you, these are the type that we did in ProbStat. But the idea here is, so imagine that we have eight parts. Okay. Some of them could be defective and some will be good. So for, imagine, uh, for example, imagine that three, these three are defective. Or it could be the next time we do it, perhaps these two are defective. Or maybe the next time we do it, we happen to have a bad lot and maybe five of them are defective. So out of the eight, there's different probabilities that different numbers of the parts are defective. I want the probability that exactly two are defective. Okay. Um, first of all, we need to examine this problem. This is a problem that is considered a binomial distribution problem. And there are four things that make this binomial. You do need to memorize this list and be familiar with it. And they follow your notes exactly here. Uh, a setting is considered binomial, first of all, if each observation falls into one of just two categories, success or failure. In this situation, when we're checking parts, they're either good or they're defective. There is no third category. Number two, there are a fixed number of observations. In this problem, we are checking eight parts and only eight parts. The number of observations could be different from problem to problem, but in this problem, we're looking at eight parts, fixed number of observations. Next piece, the observations are independent. Uh, this means that whether or not a part is dependent, uh, is defective, excuse me, does not depend on whether the one previous to it was also defective. So the observations are independent. And finally, the probability of success is constant. It doesn't change. In this, pro in this problem, the probability that a part is defective is 15%, okay? Um, so some stuff here. If we satisfy all four of these things, we say that x, the number of successes, is called a binomial variable, and we have some notation for it. Keep in mind that we had notation symbols for a normal distribution. Now we have a binomial distribution. So here, if we say x equals the number of defective parts, defectives, this means that x has a binomial distribution, big B for binomial, and we use the letters n and p inside the parentheses here. Just like we had mean and standard deviation before for normal distributions, here we're going to have N and P. So we say that X in this problem has a binomial distribution. We're checking eight parts with a probability of success of 15%. Okay, just some new symbols here. So we're going to go ahead and tackle the problem. I'm going to dive right in and give you the formula that is given to you on the AP exam. It's this nasty looking formula right here. Okay, and it may look a little intimidating, but I think when you start going through it, it's the same stuff we did in ProbStat. So let me walk you through it here. So we know that X has a binomial distribution. We're checking eight parts with the probability of success, 15%. I want the probability that X equals two, that we get two defective parts. I'm actually gonna show you the way we did this back in ProbStat. Back in ProbStat, we would have you set up two sets of parentheses. Tell me when this comes back to your memory banks. 15% is the probability that a part is defective. 85% is the probability that one is not defective. In this problem, I'm looking for two defective parts. So I need two of these guys, which means the remaining six will be not defective. And the last piece of the puzzle, if you look at the formula, is this right here. Don't be worried about this. This is just a combination. This is the same as N, C, K, if you remember combinations back from ProbStat. And what the combinations do is it takes care of all the different ways that the defectives could be mixed up with the good parts. And in this problem, it's eight C2. So at this point, you're going to have a lot of calculator practice. You should go ahead and pause the video, type that in your calculator, do the, do the practice with the exponents and the combinations, and you should find that the answer is 0.2376. So it is a problem that we did in ProbStat, just coming back to revisit us again. Let's do the second half of the question now. Now what is the probability that two or less are defective? Well, two or less means that we could have two defective parts, but we could also have one defective part. We could have zero defective parts. And we need to take these three outcomes and add their probabilities together. Now the good news is we've already done the probability of two 
It's 0.2376. Let's very quickly walk through the next two. The probability of one being defective, I need two sets of parentheses. 15% probability we're defective, 85% probability we're not. I want one defective, which means seven not defective. And we'll also put that combination in there, eight C one. Finally, the probability that we have zero defectives, again, two sets of parentheses, 0 0.15, 0 0.85. I want no defectives, eight good parts, eight C, eight, whoops, eight C zero, that's supposed to be an eight. Lost my equal sign, eight C zero, there we go. And you would add all these outcomes together. Now I'm gonna leave the work to you to add these three outcomes together but you should see that the answer comes out as 0.8948. So there's a little calculator practice for you to verify that solution. Okay, next piece. So if we have a distribution, we are interested in the mean and the standard deviation of the distribution. So now we're talking about cars here. Here's our new scenario. We have cars going in for inspection, 30% fail the inspection, and we're gonna check 50 cars. How many should we expect to fail inspection? Well, this is really an expected value problem, and the expected value is the mean, and we have formulas for mean and standard deviation here. They are given to you on the AP exam, and here they are. We see here that the mean of X in a binomial setting is given to you by NP, and we have a formula for the standard deviation as well. So let's put it all together. Again, we have, in this problem, we have X uh, is binomial. We're checking 50 cars, and the probability that a car fails inspection is 0.3. So actually, it's interesting here. We're defining X as it fails the inspection because that's the number that's given to us. Inspection, that says. We can't read it. Inspection. Okay. And I want the mean and the standard deviation. Well, I'm just going to use the formulas. The mean number of cars uh, to fail the inspection is 50, which is N, times 0.3, which is P. Put those into your calculator blender. Or actually, do it in your head. 15. On average, in a group of 50 cars, we should see 15 that fail inspection. How about the standard deviation? Again, we're just going to use the formula that we're given. It's a square root. It is n times p times 1 minus p. Here, n is 50. p is 0.15. And 1 minus p is 0.85. You notice these are just two numbers that have to add up to 1. Put those into your calculator. You see that the standard deviation comes out as 3.24. So in groups of 50 cars, on average, we should see 15 that fail inspection with a standard deviation of 3.24. Okay, one or two more things, and then we're done with this video. What I have here is, this is I copied from the textbook. These are some graphs that are binomial distributions. Let me point you through what we have here. If we took 10 observations with a probability of success 0.8, this shows you the likelihood that we get eight successes or nine successes, or 10 successes. And we have a nice histogram that comes from it. What I want you to see here is what happens as n goes from 10 to 20 to 50. How do these graphs all look different from each other? And we should notice is, in the first graph, we have a lot of bars, but then the bars get skinnier, and eventually, we have something that looks like an old friend. And the old friend here is the idea of the normal distribution. As the number of trials increases, a binomial distribution gets close or approaches a normal distribution as the number of trials increases. And in fact, there's some rules of thumb here that we use uh, to determine whether or not we can use a normal distribution. And the rule of thumb is if n times p is greater than 10 and n1 minus p is also greater than or equal to 10, then we are safe to use a normal distribution. Normal distribution is okay. Now, we don't have to use a normal distribution. This is just saying that it could be more convenient to use a normal distribution. Okay? So instead of using binomial, we could use our old friend normal and get approximately the same answer. So we'll end this video with one example of that. Take a minute read this example here. So what we have here is a random survey of 2,000 U.S. adults, and we asked them about seatbelts. Um, we asked them to respond to a, a statement about seatbelts, and it turns out 55% of them agree with the statement. Okay? So if you think about this, we have N is 2,000, P is 55%, 0.55. So therefore, if X equals the number who agree with this survey, we have a binomial variable. 
2,000 people being surveyed. We assume they're independent. And every time we survey someone, we have a 55% chance of success. So we do have a binomial variable, and we could use the binomial formula to figure out the answer to this question. But notice how the answer, the question is worded. 1,080 or less. This would be very tricky to do using our binomial formulas because we'd have to check 1,080, 1,079, 1,078, all the way down to one. So using binomial really here is not all that practical. So what I'd like to do is use a normal distribution. So can we use a normal distribution? Question mark. Well, we can if n times p is greater than or equal to 10, and then 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. Let's test that out. Well, n is 2,000. p is 0.55. I don't have to compute it. All I need to know is that it's greater than or equal to 10. And I am thoroughly convinced that this calculation is greater than 10. How about n1 minus p? That's 2,000 times 0.45. Is that greater than or equal to 10? Yeah, it is by a long shot. A little bit less than 1,000, but it's much bigger than 10. So therefore, I'm allowed to use a normal distribution. But that means I have to find the mean of x and the standard deviation of x in order to use it. And we have formulas for that. Keep in mind that the mean of x is n times p. That is 2,000 times 0.55. You can check that on your calculator. I have that handy here. That's 1,100. The standard deviation of x is this nasty formula, np times 1 minus p. That's the same as 2,000 times 0.55. 55 times 0.45, square root of all that. Put that in your calculator. We have an answer of 22.25. And I'm definitely running out of board space here. But what this all shows me is that we could also consider the number of people who agree to be a normal variable with a mean of 1,100 and a standard deviation of 22.25. And what I would like to do now is find the probability that x is less we're equal to 1,080. And you're going to use norm CDF for that. We have a normal distribution. I want a probability. I plug into my calculator. I'm going to trust that you can do norm CDF. You end up with 0.1844. Okay, a lot of stuff in this video on binomial. Um, so make sure you go through the examples. Feel free to rewind, check the book, and please come in with questions.